But we're going to continue today in our Living with Margin stewardship series. Last week we talked about the discipline of reserving a margin for compassion. Today we'll discuss what it means to reserve a margin for contentment. Now many who've read and studied the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy, you may be aware of this, you may not, but the Ten Commandments occur in, they're pretty much the same, but in slightly different forms in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 20, and I mean in chapter 5 and in Exodus chapter 20 as we've seen. And many throughout Christian history who have read those verses have recognized that what Jesus called the greatest commandment and the second greatest are in fact summaries of the two primary sections of the Ten Commandments in the Covenant of Sinai. So the passage that I'm referring to occurs in Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 through 40. And this is what the exchange says. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. So many readers of the Christian scriptures throughout Christian history, and you can find this in countless of the church fathers, found in Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 through 11, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, which are the first set of the commandments, that they explain how we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength or our mind. And many have also noticed that the second set of commandments, which we read today, which can be found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 17, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, explain how it is that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, if you're paying attention to those verses, you might have noticed that the sections overlap. And that's because the commandment to honor the Sabbath both ends the first section and begins the second. Honoring the Sabbath is an aspect both of loving God with all we are and of loving our neighbor as ourself. So we'll talk more about the way in which Sabbath observance loves God next week. But for those who were present during our joint services with the Presbyterian Church this summer, we've already begun to talk about how it is that we love our neighbor through obedience to the law. I discussed one way in which Sabbath law was a protection for the vulnerable, and hence a way of loving our neighbors by protecting their right to rest when employers may not want to give it to them. The title of that sermon was Sabbath Mercy, and you can go back and listen to it if you want, but we're not going to review that aspect of Sabbath observance today. But there is an aspect of what it means to be a people who practice Sabbath that's not only important for us to recognize, but it's actually essential to understanding the underlying principles of all of the commandments. Not only was Sabbath observance an expressing, uh, expression of loving God with all oneself, not only was Sabbath observance an expression of care and concern for laborers and for vulnerable people by limiting the power of the wealthy, but Sabbath observance was also a practice which limited personal ambition and personal greed. It's this aspect of Sabbath that I want to talk about today. Sabbath law in the covenant of Moses involved three primary cycles. And if you were part of that service with the Presbyterian Church, I went over this in much greater detail, but I'll just summarize them. The one most familiar to us is the one day in seven to rest. But Sabbath law also required the Israelites to not plant or harvest their farmland every seventh year and to release all of their slaves, cancel all outstanding debts, and return all property to the original landowners every 50th year. So that's all part of Sabbath law. In all of these cases, God was limiting Israel's ability to profit to excess. He was not allowing them to reap that all their labor, all their livestock, and all their land could have produced. He's limiting their success. The general requirements for the weekly Sabbath are found in the verses we read today in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, and you can also find them in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. The Exodus passage, just to remind us, reads this way. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
For six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male slave or your female slave or your cattle or your resident who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. For that reason the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now part of what God was injecting into the culture of Israel through this weekly requirement was the expectation of contentment. After six days of creation, God rested. Have you asked yourself why? I mean, God did not apparently burn the midnight oil, nor did he continue making hay while the sun shone. Presumably, God could have created forever. He could have tinkered forever with creation. So far as we know, God does not require rest. He doesn't require recuperation. The text doesn't say that he rested because he was tired or he was worn out or he was in need of a vacation. The scriptures do not describe God as a being who requires any of those things. And yet he rested. Why? Well, the text of Genesis tells us exactly why he rested. We find the following explanation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. God rested out of contentment. From God's perspective, he had done enough, and he was pleased with his work. Now, was there more to do? Of course there was more to do. This is chapter 1. There are 928 more chapters to go in the scriptures, and they constitute how many thousands of years? Who could even say? God didn't rest because he was tired or burnt out, nor did he rest because there was nothing left to do. God rested because he was contented with what he had done to that point. Have you ever finished a project and had someone come and look at it and you've worked hours on this project and the first thing they notice is something else that needs to be done? How do you feel? Discontentment will eat your lunch, as we used to say in Massachusetts when I was growing up. With the initial stages of God's work completed and finding it to be very good, God rested. We're told in Exodus that this contentment is the foundation of the observation of Sabbath. And this principle of contentment underlies the rest of the commandments that follow. Exodus chapter 20 continues in verse 12 in the following way. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be prolonged on the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male slave or his female slave or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. To put these commandments in terms of contentment, we might understand them as follows. Be content to always be the child and never the authority in your parents' home. Teenagers need to hear that, but so do adults when their parents begin to age and decline. Be content with those among whom you live, and do not seek to remove them unlawfully from the earth. Be content with the current marital situation of others, and do not seek to interrupt it. Be content with your current material possessions. Be content with the truth, even if you believe a lie will be a benefit to you and to others. Be content with the current state of your life, even if your neighbor seems to be faring better. When Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he suggested that the contentment required by God will not only be beneficial to you if you embrace it, but beneficial to those with whom you live. By embracing contentment, we love not only ourselves, but we also love our neighbors. Now that principle underlies an enormous amount of the teachings of the New Testament. The New Testament epistles of, of James, for instance, expresses this way of understanding the commandments poignantly in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. We find him saying this, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your body's parts? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder, and you're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend what you request on your pleasures. So James is saying, the source of all these problems is discontentment. 
And the Apostle Paul expresses a similar interpretation of the, lo- of the command to love God and neighbor in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. We find these words. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God. Paul is writing to Timothy. And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. All of these passages, to my reading, are quite clear summary interpretations of the Ten Commandments. However, perhaps no single passage expresses the heart of the Ten Commandments more succinctly than Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 to 5. And some translations are better than others uh, of the Hebrew. I'm using the New Revised Standard Version because this is good enough. It says, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Be wise enough to desist. We've got to say that together. Can you say that with me? Do not wear yourself out to get rich but be wise enough to desist. When your eyes light upon it, wealth in this case, it's gone. For suddenly it takes wings to itself, flying like an eagle toward heaven. Just as God required Israel not to harvest to the edges of their fields, but to leave a margin for the poor and for the immigrant. That's what we talked about last week. God also required Israel not to live to the edges of their ambitions. Built into the very life and culture of ancient Israel was the requirement of contentment. Not working on the Sabbath, not trying to be in charge of one's parents, especially as they age, not allowing a disagreement to become mortally violent, not committing adultery, not stealing from one's neighbors, not spreading lies about one's neighbors, and not being envious of of what others have were all ways of saying, be content. To put this encouragement in the terms of margin, we must reserve a margin for contentment. Now this doesn't mean that we don't try to, whatever this means, live up to our potential. It's not an excuse for laziness or an excuse for idleness. The Bible speaks against all those ways of interpreting contentment in both Testaments. What it does mean is that we must deny ourselves the fulfillment of our ambitions. We must deny ourselves the fulfillment of our ambitions. In other words, the scriptures would encourage all who follow Jesus to stop just short of victory, to rest just before grabbing the brass ring, to intentionally stop short of the top. Now that sounds ridiculous. Does it should. You live in America. That is not the American way. And it would sound ridiculous. It sounded ridiculous even to Jesus' disciples. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus began, when he began discussing the inevitability of his death, he started to do that well before Judas betrayed him in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, it was a primary topic of conversation at Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. So it's not surprising that the disciples started to ask themselves a very simple question. Who's going to lead this thing when Jesus is gone? Which of us is the greatest? Who is going to inherit the ministry? They started asking that. And the Gospel of Luke tells us that they asked it at the Last Supper. They began discussing that at the Supper. And wouldn't you, when Jesus starts talking about eating his body and drinking his blood and the fact that he's going to be handed over and persecuted, they're all going, okay, so I don't know, this guy has a death wish, but we've got to ask ourselves, who's going to handle this thing when he's gone? The recollection of their discussion can be found in Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. The text says this. This is at the Last Supper. This is at the table. Whenever you've seen it acted out, did you ever see this happening at the table? Because this is at the table. And a dispute also developed among them as to which one of them was regarded as being the greatest. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles domineer over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way for you, Rather, the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you, 
as the one who serves. Now, there is little doubt that working seven days a week can increase revenues. Can anyone argue with that? There's little doubt that as our parents age, they become increasingly frail, and it becomes both easy and expedient to treat them as dependent children. There's little doubt that removing a rival or getting vengeance on an abuser can provide social, financial, and even emotional gains. There's little doubt that breaking up a marriage can be a means to increase one's ego and in some cases, perhaps even one's temporal happiness. There's little doubt that stealing can and has long been a means to change one's station. It seems demonstrable that lying on the stand so that a guilty person is rightly convicted can be a means to a type of justice. And it seems quite clear that greed and envy can be powerful motivators to self-improvement and personal development. And yet God commanded Israel to avoid all of these ways of living, whatever potential benefits they might have served. Even more, when God himself took on human flesh in the person of Jesus, he lived out precisely the values he was asking Israel to adopt. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, left a margin for contentment. And as the Apostle Paul has explained in his epistle to the Philippians, it was due to Jesus' self-denial and his refusal to grab the brass ring that he's been exalted to the highest place. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5-11 through 11 says the following, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." If anyone could have achieved greatness on the earth, it was Jesus. Jesus healed diseases, cured lifelong infirmities, fed thousands of people with small amounts of food, calmed storms with a word, and even raised the dead. If Jesus were in charge of America, he could have walked down to Florida, spoken to the wind, and the hurricane would have dissipated. People will follow such a person. Wouldn't wouldn't you follow such a person? Better to be on his side, I would think. If anyone could have reached for the brass ring, it was Jesus. But Jesus, God in the flesh, humbled himself. He did not grasp for what he deserved, or even for what he had the capacity to achieve. Instead, he lived out consistently the ethics of God, ethics of humility, of submission, of generosity. And in so doing, he not only demonstrated that he was God in the flesh, but he also proved himself worthy of trust, the trust necessary to lead in God's kingdom. No one was safer than Jesus. Jesus left a margin for contentment. Instead of overthrowing Caesar, Jesus submitted to the authority God had granted to human governments, even to death on a Roman cross. Instead of seizing power from the Jewish leaders, who clearly knew less than he did about everything, Jesus respected their roles of authority and submitted himself to their judgment, even to death on a cross. Instead of starting a populist movement that would grow into a powerful new religion during his lifetime, Jesus continued to preach God's word, even when it chased away most of those who followed him. Jesus' only ambition was to do the will of the Father. Truly in Jesus, some of you remember the old hymn, the things of earth had grown strangely dim in the light of the Father's glory and grace. We remember that a core conviction of this series of discussions is this. A person's capacity to be generous depends fundamentally on the amount of margin in his or her life. There's an old saying, to a hammer, Everything looks like a nail. You've heard it? Well, to put that sentiment in our current context, to the ambitious, everything looks either like a tool to be used or an obstacle to be overcome. 
To the ambitious Sunday is just another 24 hours in which money can be made. Right? Talent is a resource to be used to its greatest effect. If we are to be a generous people, a people who love our neighbors as ourselves, we must leave a margin for contentment. As personally motivating as discontentment can be, it forces us to see our neighbors as means to our ends. To the ambitious, a person who confronts us or disagrees with us is an obstacle to be overcome or to be removed. To the ambitious, a person who comforts us or agrees with us is an asset to be exploited. We must learn another way from Jesus. If we're truly to love our neighbors as ourselves, we have to stop setting our aim beyond them. If we're truly to follow Jesus, we must not harvest to the edges of our fields, nor must we live to the limits of our ambitions. God would have advised us to reserve a margin of our resources for the poor and for the immigrant, and God would advise us to leave a margin between us and the brass ring that we might learn contentment. By this we might learn from Jesus what it means to love our neighbors as ourselves, rather than to love them as means to our ends, or as obstacles that are in our way. May the Lord add his blessing to the exploration of his word today.